Example, uniform circular plate charge. So we have a finite circular plate charge on the left of radius big R and uniform charge density rho sub S. So the first question is, what is the total charge? And we're going to follow the recipe that we laid out in the notes. So step one, draw the problem. Well, we've already done that. Step two, choose a coordinate system. Well, how about cylindrical? It looks much more like a cylinder than it does a sphere or anything rectangular-ish or Cartesian-ish. So I think cylindrical coordinates is how we'll proceed. Write the general equation. So when we laid out the recipe in the notes, we had a table and the columns were line charge, surface charge, volume charge, the rows were total charge and electric flux. And we would pull an equation out independent of the coordinate system, depending what we wanted to calculate. Well, here is a uh, total charge for a surface charge. And so that's the equation that we pull out. At this point, we write expressions for each of the terms. Now we take into account the coordinate system. Well, the rho sub s, the surface charge density, that's just a constant. So that just stays rho sub s. But our differential surface, well, we go to yet another table when we talked about vector calculus and differential lengths and areas and volumes, and then the scalar differential surface for the z direction was rho d rho d phi. So we can plug those back into the original integral, and now we have to choose the limits of integration. Well, first we're integrating over phi. Right, that's the angle around the z-axis. And we wanna go all the way around to include the whole circle. So we'll go from zero to two pi. Now for rho, we're going to go zero to r. We don't wanna go from negative r to big R because then when we take phi all the way zero to two pi, we would actually have included that circle twice. So we're going to take rho from zero to r. We always choose these limits of integration so that we cover the entire length, area, or volume with no voids and no overlaps. So at this point, the electromagnetics is done and we can hand this equation over to a mathematician and they could solve this to get total charge for us without having to consider any more electromagnetic anything. So here's the integral we wanna solve and what should we do? What I like to do first is to isolate the integral over rho. So we need to integrate rho d rho from zero to r. So what is the antiderivative of rho? Well, that's rho squared over two. So we'll evaluate this at big R and then subtract that same expression evaluated at zero. When we do that, we just get r squared and we can bring that to the outside of the integral along with rho s and this factor of two. So now we're just left with an integral of phi from zero to two pi of just d phi. Well, there's kind of like a one here and the antiderivative of one is phi. And so we evaluate that from zero to two pi, we just get two pi. Technically it's two pi minus zero, but the zero is not there. So then we have a, we can cancel our twos and we can bring the pi over. And now we have an expression for total charge, pi r squared rho s. Does the pi r squared sound familiar to you? Well, it turns out that's the area of the circle. So for a uniform charge density, we can write a different equation, which uh, in some ways is more useful. It's just the surface charge density times the area of the surface. So it doesn't matter what the surface looks like. It could look like a potato chip or a horse saddle or something completely crazy. As long as we know the surface area S and we know it has a uniform charge density, we can calculate the total charge using this equation. On to the next question. What is the total D field? To make the math simpler, we're going to evaluate the D field on the Z axis. So our rho and phi terms here are both zero. We're just evaluating at some position Z. Let's follow the recipe. Draw the problem. Well, we've already done that. Choose a coordinate system. Let's stick with cylindrical. 
write the general equation. So we go to that table that had all of our equations and we pull out the one for calculating total electric flux given a surface charge and we end up here. From this integral, I'll move all the constants to the outside of the integral. And really what I'm just left with is the ds a sub r unit vector divided by r squared. So we keep the, the ds differential surface here, but the unit vector a r over r squared, I'm going to write as big R divided by magnitude r cubed. So remember what that R is. When we're performing this surface integration, we're essentially rastering through all of the area in this circle. So if our differential surface happens to be right here where I have the red cursor, that vector R connects where we're integrating from, our little differential surface, up to the observation point. So how do we calculate that R? Well, it's the end point minus the start point. So the end point, is zero phi z. Now notice a little trick here. I have a zero in here. If we're on the axis, it doesn't really matter what angle phi we write. So I'm writing phi here because when I do this subtraction, these two phi's will end up canceling. If I didn't do that, we'd have a negative phi over here. So since I'm able to choose any angle here, I chose one that simplifies the answer in the end. And the end point has a z for the z coordinate minus a zero. So the answer for this r vector is minus rho in the rho direction, z in the z direction, and that's it. The rho s term, the surface charge density, that's just a constant. So the rho s just stays rho s. Our differential surface, we go to another table back from vector calculus and where we were summarizing differential length, surface, and volumes, we look for a differential surface that would actually be the vector surface pointing in the z direction, but we're just taking the scalar part of that. And so that's rho d rho d phi. The magnitude of that r vector. Well, if I look at what the r vector is, then I know it's minus rho squared or just rho squared plus z squared. So we plug all of that stuff back into the integration. We have our, our vector r, we have the magnitude of that vector r cubed, we have our ds, and we have our constants to the outside, and we're choosing our limits of integration now. We're going to choose the exact same limits that we did for the total charge. So in terms of the phi angle, 0 to 2 pi, so that's all the way around the circle. And in terms of radius, zero to r. So we're just integrating from zero to r. We don't want to go from minus r to positive r because then when we integrate phi from zero to two pi, we would include the area twice. And so we always choose our limits of integration in a way that we fill the entire length, surface, or volume with no voids and no overlaps. So here's the integral from the previous slide. Let's think about this now. Let's say we're at a differential surface element somewhere right around here where I have my red cursor. Well, if I trace up to the observation point, that is going to produce a D field in the direction that I'm wiggling the cursor. Now, if I go to the opposite side of the Z axis and I think about what D field this differential surface charge would create, I would trace up to our observation point and it would create a D field off this way. So if we think about that, those two D fields are both pointing upward, they would add upward, but in terms of the rho direction, they perfectly cancel. And if you imagine integrating all the way around, all of those rho components would end up canceling because every point on the left has a point on the right that would cancel. So in fact, we can go into this equation and just completely ignore the rho component. Just from symmetry, we know that the row components will vanish and we just have to worry about the z component. So at this point, we can bring the z because that's not a function of phi or rho. We can bring that to the outside along with the az unit vector and we're left with a much simpler expression on the inside. Notice I brought this rho squared plus z squared to the three halves power up to the numerator by giving this a negative three halves. So by putting the negative, it really does mean one over this expression to the positive three halves. And I didn't touch the differential surface. 
So what do we do now? Well, what I like to do first is isolate this phi integral because that's nice and easy. We're just integrating from zero to two pi of d phi. So everything in here just ends up being two pi. Well, I have a four pi over here, which would cancel with this two pi just to give me a two in the denominator. So this is where we'll proceed on the next slide and we have to solve this integral. So this is where we were from the previous slide and we need to solve our final integral. Let's do this by substitution. Let's define some auxiliary parameter V that doesn't really have any physical meaning that we care about. And we're just gonna let that equal rho squared plus Z squared because that's the argument inside the parentheses. And if I could just make what's in here a single variable to the minus three halves, that's pretty easy to calculate the antiderivative of. So that's how we define V. Well, if we're going to put this integral now in terms of V, we're going to need a starting V, an ending V, and we're going to need to relate D rho to DV to convert it all over to integrate in terms of V instead of rho. So differentiate. So DV is simply two rho D rho. And the Z square, the differential that just, we get zero. So we only end up with two rho D rho, and this is the equation that we have that relates D rho and DV. So D rho is simply DV over two rho. Now our original starting point rho at zero, that translates to a new starting point V1. And so we'll put zero in for rho here and just get zero squared plus Z squared. So our new starting point for the integral is Z squared. The ending point for our integral, the old one anyway, rho two was simply R. So let's calculate a new ending point V2 by putting big R in for rho up here. So it's an R squared, big R squared plus Z squared. We now have everything we need to write this R integral in terms of V. So we have our new starting V, our new ending V. We now have V to the minus three halves, but we still have a row here that came from up here and we're replacing D row with DV over two row. We now see that this row can cancel with this row and this two can come to the outside to give us a four. So that's where we are. Now this is easy to integrate. This is the integral from the previous slide after we convert that integral over to V. So the antiderivative of V to the minus three halves is V to the minus one half divided by the minus one half. So I can bring this minus one half out, combine it over here, we get a negative sign and we also get it divided by two instead of four because the one half times the four is a two. And the V to the minus one half is just one over square root of V. So I have to take this expression evaluated at R squared plus Z squared, then subtract that expression evaluated at Z squared. So that's a piece of cake, long expression. And I end up here. So the D total is simply rho S over two and a bunch of stuff in parentheses in the Z direction. And the bunch of stuff in parentheses, it's what accounting for the finite size of this surface charge.